Hello everyone and welcome to this video series hosted by Farmers Weekly on animal nutrition. Uh, during the series, we will be calling in various experts and researchers from the Agricultural Research Council's um, Animal Production Institute to talk to you about the importance of animal nutrition in animal health and overall productivity. Our first guest today is Georgette Pius, a junior researcher at the ARC API. Welcome Georgette and thank you for joining us. Good morning, thank you for having me. For starters, let's elaborate on your role at the API. What is it that you actually do there? So I'm a junior researcher at the ARC. Uh, I'm basically still in the developmental phase of my career. I'm also um, someone that carries out specific research objectives, which have specific research outputs targeted at beef cattle farmers. Um, I'm also part of a crossbreeding project that basically looks at how climate and climatic conditions may affect crossbred beef cattle um, in terms of their production as well and their fertility. You mentioned crossbreeding. Uh, does this involve specifically indigenous breeds with, um, they say, crossbreeding indigenous breeds to European breeds? Yes, it involves indigenous breeds crossed with exotic breeds, such as European, yes. Okay, and what are the most common cattle breeds in South Africa? Uh, there's three most common cattle breeds. The first is the Bons Mara. This is a composite breed. It's a crossbreed as well, as we all know. Um, it is comprised of the indigenous Africana, crossed with that of the British type breeds, the Shorthorn and the Hereford. It's also known to be a well-adapted breed in South Africa. The second is the Angus, which is exclusively bred for meat production in South Africa. And the third is the exotic breed, that of the Brahman. And this exotic breed, um, the Brahman type, is known to be fairly well adapted to South African uh, weather conditions. And do indigenous breeds feature at all in the national flock? I know, so obviously there are a few Nguni farmers, let's say, but um, do they make a big contribution to the national flock? Indigenous breeds do feature highly, yes. Um, they are known to be very adapted, as I've mentioned before. Um, for instance, the Africana is indigenous, as well as the Nguni and Nguni types. Specifically, the Nguni types are uh, known to be very uh, highly resistant to ticks and tick-borne diseases. The indigenous Africana is very um, significant in the meat market. And these two breeds are also known to be, well, to known to produce relatively tender and um, tasty meats. Okay, so Jodrette, I recently read your research paper on the comparison between the water intake of Africana and Nguni cattle. Could you elaborate perhaps a bit on what the results of that research was? Uh, yes, the reason for us doing that research was to look at how climate affects water behavior and intakes of different beef cattle genotypes, particularly in the study we used just indigenous breeds, the purebred Africana and then Nguni. Um, we uh, did this in a controlled system where we did this over the period of the summer. Uh, we had a number of heat waves that we experienced during this time, so we got a lot of good uh, recordings from this data. Basically, this data showed us that between the indigenous and uh, indigenous Africana, that is, and the indigenous Nguni breeds, there was large differences in water intake over periods of time where heat waves were experienced. This means that the animals undergone heat stress. So, therefore, we see that the Africana and the Africana types were well adapted to heat in a sense that their water intakes uh, were less variant over this period of time than the Nguni. The Nguni uh, seemed to intake between 30 to 40 liters more per day per group type. And this is uh, a group of 10 to 15 animals per pen. So between that 10 to 15 animals at the time, it uh, was an ad added intake um, more than the Africana of about 30 to 40 liters, yeah. So just to clarify for our viewers, so the less water the animal consumes, the less heat stress it's experiencing. Um, I wouldn't say such. I would say that it's more well adapted to know how much water intake to utilize um, under that uh, condition. Can you elaborate on any cross-reading research that the ARC is currently undertaking? Uh, yes, earlier I mentioned that I'm, I'm, I'm a part of a crossbreeding project. Uh, this crossbreeding project started in 2013. Uh, this was made between an agreement made by the ARC and the Northern Cape Department of Agriculture. 
Basically, in this crossbreeding project, um, we took indigenous Afrikaner and Nguni dams, as well as the Bonsmara dam lines, uh, cows, and we crossed them with Afrikaner, Bonsmara, and Nguni bulls, as well as uh, inclusive of specialized sire lines, or bulls that is, of Angus and Simmentala. This resulted in us having 15 different um, breeds of cattle. Uh, we had the 12 crossbred genotypes or breeds, and we had the three purebreds of our indigenous. And what were you looking for? What was the goal of the, the project? Um, so the goal of the project was to just see how temperature and different extensive farming productions compared to commercial uh, farming has an effect on the different breed types, especially the cross breeds, because this re uh, research was never done before. Mm -hmm. So we did, we maintained uh, the study where we took cross breeds. Uh, we looked at them in extensive farming conditions where nutrition was limited and um, also the, there was a number of heat waves and heat stress that the animals had undergone. Also in these extensive farming systems, the managerial uh, skills or uh, I would say the management was not so good on these farms. And then the study, well, the results actually indicated that the indigenous breeds had a significant uh, production uh, compared to that of the exotic breeds. The exotic breeds didn't form in, uh, perform so well. Um, they had uh, less water intakes, they had um, less growth, they had less ADG, average daily gain, um, and also their feed, takes, feed intakes were much higher. What were the results in terms of the crossbred animals? Did they show greater adaptability or better heat adaptability? Yes, um, in terms of certain production traits, particularly to feed intake and growth. In Guni, uh, in Guni type and Africana type breeds, um, they basically uh, performed way, way better than exotic breeds. Exotic breeds were not well adapted to the heat, so their feed intakes over time increased and the average daily gain, for instance, and growth in particular, didn't increase at all. So they utilized a lot of feed but they didn't grow much at all. So for, for, on a productivity level, um, this was not uh, sensible or desirable. So farmers would look to maybe utilize indigenous breeds such as Afrikaner and Nguni types, and maybe use smaller cows of those types and mate them with the exotic breeds. Uh, maybe with this, the growth might uh, be bigger and also the productivity or the input costs into productivity might be less. Uh, so they'll get more with less input costs in this regard. What, in terms of heat stress, would you expect animals to eat more during uh, periods of heat stress? Or would they, I was always under the impression that animals actually eat less during this period. Um, yes, from, from one of our studies that we did, uh, we saw that uh, in Guni and, in, and Afrikaner types and crosses, uh, throughout the day when they experience heat stress, they would eat frequently between three and 400 grams at a time. And the exotic type breeds, the Angus and Simmentala, they would eat only in the evenings and they would eat uh, one go at a time between 90 and 19 and 20 kgs. And then the next day they would suffer from heat stress. So this indicated to us that um, adapted breeds such as these uh, indigenous crosses and their purebreds uh, pure as well, Afrikaner and Nguni, they also know when and how to eat during these periods of heat stress, which we uh, frequently experience, especially in South Africa in the summer seasons. Indeed. If you had to start your own cattle farm, what breed would you invest in or what crossbreed would you invest in? Um, I wouldn't say any breed in particular is better than the other. Uh, I would crossbreed uh, breeds such as indigenous breeds, but of a progeny that produces higher, um, for instance, depends on what you want to produce. If you want to produce uh, milk, if you want to produce uh, meat, then you would obviously look to uh, progeny first. You'll start with progeny, you'll look at the backgrounds of the, or the genetics of the animals, um, and then you'll uh, probably take maybe in Guni types or Afrikaner types. I think Afrikaner types are more desirable as well because um, they are more uh, adapted and uh, resistant to certain diseases, especially common diseases which we find in South Africa. Um, the Nguni is good in a sense that fertility is good uh, regardless of 
in environmental factors. Uh, the Nguni is also specifically known from studies to be high resistant, highly resistant to ticks and tick-borne diseases. So between those two breeds, I would probably mate them with uh, an Angus type or Brahman types. Finally, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing, let's say specifically, beef producers in 2023? Okay, specifically beef producers, um, well, the farming industry on a whole is uh, undergoing a lot of constraints uh, with the current pow power outages that happen. Um, it compromises farmers and their productivity. So this will, in a sense, I think, push them to more use, push them to in, into the direction of using more uh, adapted breeds, such as indigenous breeds, which I've mentioned are highly adaptable. And in this case, uh, they don't use or need uh, technological modifications in order to meet their uh, productivity, uh, production potential, sorry. Um, if you also uh, decide to import uh, germplasm like embryos and semen, this will be a high input cost, but you cannot guarantee that your productivity would be high because those breeds are not adapted for our climates. Um, secondly, uh, the foot and mouth disease, uh, that is, um, it's, it's really constraining for farmers in a sense that it limits their transportation of animals. Um, thirdly, not lastly, climate change. Um, we're looking at doing more studies on climate change uh, to help mitigate and I improve on farmers and their productivity. Right now, one of the bigger projects that we're working on is climate smart beef production. And um, this looks at how uh, crossbred cattle in general as well, specifically, how they cope under different environmental factors as well. So um, we're trying to also uh, produce climate smart warning systems for farmers so that we can help them with their productivity. And also we want to recommend more usage of crossbreeds. So in terms of the research that the ARC is doing um, with crossbred animals, what is the goal of the research? Is it purely just for research and expanding the knowledge around crossbreeds? Or is there a goal to integrate crossbred animals into uh, the national herd? Yes, um, ultimately it is a bit of both of what you've asked. Uh, firstly, the crossbreeding projects was designed to see if crossbred beef cattle perform well, um, especially under adverse climatic conditions. Um, we do offer information about our research to farmers. We try to indicate to them that there is benefits to crossbreeding, such as heterosis, which is basically where um, a crossbreed uh, progeny, like for instance, if you cross a Africana with a Bonsmara, the progeny uh, and its performance will wield well over the performance of the purebred Africana and Bonsmara. Um, also, our research looks to implement um, opportunities for farmers to, in a sense, uh, produce Afri beef. And Afri beef is a specialized premium meat, and this can be sold at a higher cost. So there's an opportunity there for a niche market farmers can get into and increase their production and their uh, profits, that is. Thank you very much, Georgette, for sure. being with us. Thank you.